Well, good morning and welcome to our service here at Fullerton Temple. Let's please rise for our opening prayer. And let us interiorize our consciousness as we pray. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. O oh, beloved Christ, present in the body of Jesus, manifest in us as the strength of thy light and as the power of thy perfect wisdom. Om. Peace. Amen. Please be seated. And it's a great pleasure to be here with you here this week before Christmas. And I think it's very evident from all our lovely Christmas decorations what time of year it actually is. You know, for me, growing up, Christmas was always the most special time of year. Was it for you too? For many of us, I know. Because there was always the, well, the decorations, but then all the people, the visitors, the family visits, all the special events. And then there were the very special and poignant religious uh, symbols and messages that came with the time of year. But beyond that, it was only after I came to the Self-Realization Fellowship teachings that I discovered that there's actually much more to the Christmas season than just what I had grown up with. Because for our guru and founder Paramahansa Yogananda, he explained Christmas as another dimension of spiritual perception. He explained it this way, to bring divine awareness into our human consciousness, we must outgrow the limited conventional conception of Christ. To me, Christmas is a thought of spiritual grandeur, a realization that our minds are an altar of Christ, the universal intelligence in all creation. Now that's quite a statement, actually. He's saying our minds, that's each one of us, is an altar of that consciousness that Jesus had. He goes on. To human vision, he is the little babe born in Bethlehem and the Savior who healed the sick and raised the dead. Well, that's the traditional vision of Christ and uh, Christmas in the West. But he goes on to divine vision. He is the Christ awareness in all space and in every atom. So that's a description, all space and in every atom. That's omnipresence, isn't it? And how do you get your mind around that? Because our human understanding just can't comprehend infinity, not very well, <laughs> and omnipresence. What is the omnipresence of spirit? Our guru, he actually explains it, he describes it many, many different times throughout his teachings. He says, spirit is the endless chamber of wallless, bliss-filled space 
resplendent with flickering stars and innumerable planetary lights. And he's saying that is the consciousness which we all have too. The Christ consciousness in Jesus, at one with the evolver knower of all, was able to perceive with countless eyes in every speck of space, past, present, and future. And he says, you should aspire to know that Christ within you. Okay, that's uh, maybe a fairly startling injunction. Because we've got a lot of transforming to do, don't we? To make that happen. It implies two different things. First, that we have the potential to change ourselves into that state of consciousness, into omnipresent awareness. And second, it implies that there is a way to actually make that happen. And our guru is quite emphatic on both points, that yes, we can make ourselves into this state of consciousness. He says, you are made in the image of God and you must discard your limitations. That's not a question, <laughs> it's a statement. And he gives the how to do it. He says, by meditation. Become one with the limitlessness of God and thus end all your sorrow and suffering. And so that is the purpose of Self-Realization Fellowship. These teachings are to show us how we can actually transform ourselves into this expanded state of consciousness. And we do it through our meditation techniques. These methods from ancient India of life energy control, life force control, where we learn as we sit and practice these techniques, we can begin to withdraw that energy that is normally just flowing into our nerves and the organs and the muscles and all of that and keeping our consciousness always fixed on outer stuff, we can withdraw it. We can bring it into the centers in the spine, in the chakras. And as we do this, the outer stuff of the world recedes. It's through techniques such as Kriya Yoga that we can be very effectively bring that life energy within the spine, in the chakras, and then we bring that energy up the, to the higher chakras and center it here at this point, at the point between the two eyebrows, at the Christ Consciousness Center. This is the star of the East that's spoken of in the Bible. And as you become aware of the light at that center, you can then condense that light into greater definition and see that it's actually a golden halo with a dark blue center. And in the middle of that is a brilliant five-pointed star. And just being able to see that spiritual eye is a mark of spiritual advancement. But what we want to be able to do is actually enter into that spiritual eye. And when we can do that, we go into that state of expanded awareness that state of Christ consciousness and even beyond. And so that's why we're going to have a meditation right now where we can practice some of our techniques and begin to perceive that 
state of universal consciousness right within ourselves. So let's sit upright with the feet flat on the floor. We take our hands, we place them with palms upturned at the juncture of the thighs and the abdomen, and the chin is parallel to the ground. Back is away from the back of the chair, the pew. And let's start now with a chant. Cloud-colored Christ, come. And as we chant, keep the gaze focused at this center between the two eyebrows, at the Christ Consciousness Center. Because this is where we see that star of Christ. The Christ that's hidden behind the clouds of creation. But it's right there. Let us call it into our own consciousness. Cloud colored Christ, come, O oh my cloud colored Christ, come, O oh my Christ, O oh my Christ, O oh my Christ, O oh my Christ, Jesus Christ, come, cloud colored Christ, come, O oh my cloud colored Christ, come. O oh my Christ, O oh my Christ, O oh my Christ, O oh my Christ, Jesus Christ, come, cloud-colored Christ, come, O oh my cloud-colored Christ, come, O oh my Christ, O oh my Christ, O oh my Christ, O oh my Christ, Jesus Christ, come. Cloud colored Christ, come, O oh my cloud colored Christ, come, cloud colored Christ, come, O oh my cloud colored Christ, come, O oh my Christ, O oh my Christ, O oh my Christ, O oh my Christ, Jesus Christ, come. O oh my Christ, O oh my Christ, O oh my Christ, O oh my Christ, Jesus Christ, come. O oh my Christ, O oh my Christ, O oh my Christ, O oh my Christ, Jesus Christ, come. Cloud colored Christ, come. O oh my cloud colored Christ, come. Cloud colored Christ, come, oh my cloud colored Christ, come. Cloud colored Christ, come, oh my cloud colored Christ, come. And now let us keep focusing at that point as we meditate in silence.
So, our topic for today, what do you think we would talk about? <laughs> Attunement with the Christ Consciousness, which of course we've been talking about all along. This is that expanded awareness that Jesus had, being the birthright of every human being. Our destiny as souls is to return to the state of consciousness from which we came from originally, destined to do that. And our guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, explains, actually, it's not a state we have to attain so much as a state we have to remember. We already own it, as it were. But what's the difference? I was thinking about that, and it came to me, well, there is a difference. For instance, you have a bank account, you got a million dollars in it. How does that feel? We're all millionaires. But you have a password that you have to have to get into the account, and you forgot it. That's a problem. More than that, you forgot you even have the bank account. You don't even know you have a million dollars. That's where we're in right now, the state of consciousness. We're not even aware of that. Well, this is what the self-realization teachings are all about. First, to remind us, we've got that million dollar spiritual consciousness right within us. But then beyond that, through the techniques of these meditation practices, we've got the password to open that account. And so it's not that we have to go back and make another million dollars doing all the stuff, whatever that might take to do. No, all we have to do is open the account and we're there. Okay? So let's do it. This, this is the season, this is the time of year we can make a lot of progress in that direction to give us this attunement with the Christ Consciousness. But one difficulty with this whole concept of Christ Consciousness is that it's beyond, as I said, it's beyond our human comprehension to even understand it. As our guru said, it is impossible to translate explicitly into human language the state of Jesus' consciousness. It was everywhere. It was everything. This state of omnipresence, he says, you can't put it into human language, which, you know, that kind of makes sense, that human language doesn't contain vocabulary for things that are beyond human comprehension. And so Jesus had this difficulty too in his own time when consciousness was even less limited than it is now, when people had no understanding. We talked about life energy and you know controlling that life force uh, through meditation techniques. Well, Jesus he couldn't talk about life energy because there was no term for energy at the time when he was living in his physical incarnation. And so Jesus had to use terms like the bread of life. People could understand bread, but that's what he had to use, that symbology, that metaphor, in order just to approach this concept, which is not within people's understanding. They had no vocabulary for it. And so I thought it might be helpful for us in talking about this attainment of, with the Christ consciousness to look at some of the many, many different metaphors and symbols that we have all around us that refer to this state of expanded 
awareness that are very much part of our Christmas tradition, even though most people don't really understand the deeper significance of those symbols. And references. One of these is this editorial from uh, the New York Sun. It was written uh, over a hundred years ago. Uh, and you may have heard this before, but I, it's one of my favorite Christmas uh, inspirations. The editor writes, We take pleasure in answering at once and thus prominently the communication below, expressing at the same time our great gratification that its faithful author is numbered among the friends of the sun. And here's the letter. Dear editor, I am eight years old. Some of my little friends say there is no Santa Claus. Papa says, if you see it in the sun, it is so. Please tell me the truth. Is there a Santa Claus? Signed. Virginia O'Hanlon, 115 West 95th Street. I looked it up. You can, uh, the house is still there. <laughs> it's called the O'Hanlon House. They're in Manhattan. And here's the answer from the editor. Virginia, your little friends are wrong. They have been affected by the skepticism of a skeptical age. They do not believe except what they see. They think that nothing can be which is not comprehensible by their little minds. All minds of Virginia, whether they be men's or children's, are little. In the great universe of ours, man is but an insect, an ant in his intellect, as compared with the boundless world about him, as measured by the intelligence capable of grasping the whole of truth and knowledge? Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist. And you know that they abound and give our life its highest beauty and joy. Alas, how dreary would be the world if there were no Santa Claus. It would be as dreary as if there were no Virginias. There would be no childlike faith then, no poetry, no romance to make tolerable this existence. We should have no enjoyment except in sense and sight. The eternal light which childhood fills the world with would be extinguished. Not believe in Santa Claus? You might get your papa to hire men to watch the chimneys on Christmas Eve to catch Santa Claus, but even if they did not see Santa coming down, what would that prove? Nobody sees Santa, but that's no sign. There is no Santa Claus. The most real things in the world are those that neither children nor men can see. Nobody can conceive or imagine all the wonders that are unseen and unseeable in the world. There is a veil covering the unseen world, which not the strongest man could tear apart. Only faith, fancy, poetry, love, romance can push aside that curtain and view and picture the supernatural beauty and glory behind. Is it all real? Ah, Virginia, in all this world there is nothing else as real and abiding. No Santa Claus? Thank God he lives and he lives forever. A thousand years from now, maybe Ten times ten thousand years from now, he will continue to make glad the hearts of children. Okay? 
for 125 years. That's been a favorite. Talking about Santa Claus being real. Well, <laughs> he's not talking about the man in the red suit, you know, with the white beard. He's talking about the qualities that Santa Claus embodies. And it's this subconscious recognition in every person that makes this story so appealing. He speaks of all these things beyond human awareness. Nobody can conceive or imagine all the wonders there are, unseen and unseeable, in the world. He says, the veil covering the unseen world, the supernatural beauty and glory beyond this world. Well, for most people reading this, it's just an el what is it really? What's he talking about specifically? And even the author himself, did he really know? But for those of us who study the self-realization teachings, this becomes very clear what he's talking about. He's talking about what's beyond this physical world, the physical dimension of space. He's talking about the astral realm that we talk about here in Self-Realization Fellowship all the time. He's talking about these states of advanced consciousness that Jesus had. An awareness of all things throughout the universe and beyond the universe. So Santa Claus is a symbol in this sense. We have another, actually several more poignant symbols of these higher realities in the form of our Christmas tree, right here in front of our altar. And our guru explains, at the top of your Christmas tree you place a shiny star. Ever wonder what that star is all about? Guruji says, the spiritual significance of that is to symbolize the spiritual eye at the top of the tree of life. And he talks about the mystic tree of life, which is a symbol that has come down to us from antiquity. And in the Orient, in the East, the tree of life is recognized as symbolic of the human body. And our nervous system being represented by the tree's branches and its roots. And it's not just one tree, but it's three trees interwoven. He explains, in the human body, the physical tree of nerves is a gross manifestation of the astral tree of life energy within. So all of us, we're, we know about the physical body, and we have our nerves and uh, all of that stuff, but that's simply a manifestation of this astral energy, which is the blueprint for the physical nervous system. And beyond that, he says, these two trees are condensed out of the even subtler tree of human consciousness. So that's the causal tree of life. And in the West, he says, this isn't understood except symbolically in the form of the Christmas tree. But we all are this higher state of consciousness represented by that tree. He says, the throne of Christ is in your spiritual eye. When you are in tune with him there at the center of Christ consciousness, you can feel his presence and see him sleeping on the bed of stars, dancing on the billows of your feelings, 
resting on the altar of your devotion. This is why this season of the year is so special, because we can tune in more easily with these higher concepts. But this symbolism of the star of the east goes beyond just what's on the tree. In the Bible, you know the story about the three wise men? And they followed the star of the east to find the baby Jesus. The nativity story from the Christian Bible, it's simply another metaphorical setting for the many transcendent, transcendent realities of this season. So they're in, here in the book of Matthew. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh, and they departed unto their own country. Well, this story, it refers to a number of these symbolic references. So we know perhaps that it's been pointed out there may have been actually a celestial manifestation. You know, a, a meteor or a star that somehow just showed up there at that particular time. But that's not the star that the three wise men were really following. They were following the star of the spiritual eye. The star of the east. The all-revealing light of the spiritual eye, as our guru says, located in the east of the body, in a subtle spiritual center of Christ consciousness in the forehead between the two physical eyes. And we all have that, as I've been pointing out, it's right here. Now, as to who were those wise men, our guru explains this too. And this is all from his writings, his commentary on the Bible, on those teachings of Jesus, on the Gospels. In his The Second Coming of Christ, The Resurrection of the Christ Within You. And it's just a a marvelous explanation of what is so often so very difficult to understand from what is written and recorded from the actual words of Jesus. Regarding the wise men, though, legends abound, he says, concerning the wise men from the East. A common tradition is that they were magi, a priestly class of mystics among ancient Medes and Persians. But, he points out, there's a very strong tradition in India, authoritatively known among high metaphysicians in tales well told and written in ancient manuscripts, that the wise men of the East were in fact great sages of India. They came not from Persia, but from much farther to the east. And not only did the Indian masters come to Jesus, but he reciprocated their visit during those unaccounted for years of Jesus' life. You know, when he was 14 to 30 years of age, there's no mention of him in the Bible at all. Where was he? He was in India. 
he journeyed to India to reciprocate the visit paid to him at his birth by those three wise men. His own God realization, our guru says, reawakened and reinforced in the company of the masters and the spiritual environs of India provided a background of the universality of truth from which he could preach a simple, open message, comprehensible to the masses of his native country, yet with underlying meanings that would be appreciated in generations to come as the infancy of man's mind would mature in understanding. And so that simple message that he gave back then, it's maturing in these times. And especially through the instrumentality of these teachings and in writings explanations such as our guru gives in his second coming of Christ. Another event that happened during that nativity story the shepherds that were outside at night on that first Christmas night, lowly shepherds, the Bible tells us, were blessed to behold the heralding of the birth of Jesus. Is this just another story made up to make the birth of Jesus special? Our guru says, no, this actually happened. He says, God and his heavenly host celebrate the earthly incarnations of great ones whose lives are are ordained to influence the destiny of man. It was the celestial rejoicing at the advent of Jesus' birth that was seen by the shepherds. Perception of the finer vibratory dimensions are unperceived by the gross sensory instruments of the body. Like we were talking about before, we don't see the astral realm in our present state of consciousness. It's hidden behind our senses. But, he goes on, through the touch of God's grace, the veil of matter is parted. And with sight divine of the soul's spiritual eye of intuitive perception, glimpses of the heavenly spheres and beings are revealed. And that's what happened with the shepherds. God opened, for a period of time, their vision, and they could see the celestial astral happenings of those higher beings. And this is what We feel, too, when we come to the temple for our commemoration services. Even though we may not see with physical eyes the openings in the the physical dimension of space, we can feel it. And we can feel this same thing, too. Many of us did yesterday during our all-day meditation. The expansion of the heart as we tune in with those celestial celebrations. Our guru goes on, each year at Christmas time there are stronger than usual vibrations of Christ's love and joy that emanate to earth from the heavenly realms. The ether becomes filled with the infinite light that shone on earth when Jesus was born. Those persons who are in tune through devotion and deep meditation feel a wondrously tangible, transforming vibration of the omnipresent consciousness that was in Jesus Christ. So, the point of this service is for us to become like those wise men who came to visit Jesus, to follow the star, in our own spiritual eye, that star of the east, and open ourselves to 
the Christ consciousness that was manifest in the baby Jesus. We have the techniques of meditation that allow us to do this. We have everything we need. With an additional blessing, which we have in the form of the masters, the gurus, because it is a guru who allows, helps a disciple to become aware of that vision. This is what Jesus did for his disciples. He opened for them the spiritual eye and allowed them to hear the Om vibration in his own time. And we have one story about this along these lines with our own guru, Paramahansaji, and one of his very earliest disciples in the United States, Dr. Lewis. Many of you have heard this story before too. But uh, Dr. Lewis, when Guruji first came to America, he, was, he's, he landed in Boston. And so he was just finding uh, contacts and uh, getting established a little bit there in Boston. And Dr. Lewis, who lived there, he was a dentist, actually, and he had grown up in a religious setting, and uh, he was a deeply spiritual person, and he was a member of a metaphysical society. And one of his friends at that society mentioned to him of this Swami Yogananda, who'd gotten there recently, and she encouraged Dr. Lewis to meet the Swami. And he said, okay. But he wasn't really enthusiastic, he was a little reluctant. He thought, if he's a real Swami from India, why would he come to Boston, of all places? <laughs> but the meeting was set up. It was for Christmas Eve, 1920. And Dr. Lewis said that he had um, made arrangements with his wife, Mildred, to come home very soon after his meeting with the Swami because it wasn't going to take long and they were going to decorate the Christmas tree together. And so he got there to the meeting place. And so he asked him about one of the most abstruse passages in the Bible. He said, the Bible tells us the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Can you explain this? And Master said, I think so. Well, I've asked many persons. No one seems to know the meaning. And Master said, can the blind lead the blind? Both would fall into the same ditch of error. Which impressed Dr. Lewis because he recognized the Swami was repeating words from the Bible. And then the Swami looked at into his eyes and his doubts just kind of vanished. Can you show me these things? I think so. Then for heaven's sake, please show me. And then our guru showed Dr. Lewis the light of the spiritual eye and the thousand petal lotus in the brain and it was well past midnight that Dr. Lewis finally got home. And Mama Lewis had been quite concerned because not only had he said he was going to be back right away, but the Christmas tree, she had to decorate it all herself. And she was a little bit upset. In fact, the story is, she was sitting there in her rocking chair with a rolling pin, <laughs> waiting for him to come in the door. 
But when, she, when he actually came in and she saw his face and it was just transfigured, she recognized something special had happened to her husband. And uh, often afterwards, when telling of this divine awakening, Dr. Lewis said, that was my first real Christmas. Okay? That's what we are all looking for, for our real Christmas. We have all the wonderful outer things and trappings and symbols of this season. But it's the inner celebration of Christmas that's really what we are looking for. And the guru, the masters, they can give us, they will give every disciple this vision as soon as the disciple is ready. And so our guru, in closing, he says, concentrate on the star at the top of the bodily tree, the spiritual eye, and upon the Christ spirit of universal brotherhood, which is the way to, of peace. Will you remember that when you place your gifts under the tree, that you are surrendering your material desires and turning to the star of the spiritual eye for freedom? To give you that experience is why I have instituted the all-day meditation at Christmas time that you may experience the joy of Christ communion in a deeper way. And keep in mind what that Christ communion is in these last words. Remember always that you are made of immortal sparks of divine light. Every atom and cell of your body is glowing with that light. Light also forms the nerve fibers which are condensed rays of cosmic energy emanating from the astral tree of life. You are not a fleshly being. You are the divine electricity within the physical form. If only you could realize that. If you could open your eyes and see that light filling all space, all things as waves of light dancing around you, you would know that God is in his creation and that all is well. Let's keep this in mind throughout this Christmas season. And now let's rise for our healing service. And again, let's focus the gaze at the spiritual eye as we pray. Heavenly Father, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in me. Thou art in all thy children. Manifest thy healing presence in our bodies, in our minds, and in our souls. And now let us raise our arms and chant Om, sending forth vibrations of healing for the body. For healing of the mind, Om. for healing the disease of soul ignorance, Om. and once more sending forth vibrations of love, peace, hope, and harmony to all mankind. Om. 
And now let us have our closing prayer. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, our great Gurus, all saints, we bow to you all. O Divine Spirit, teach us to become true children of God, even as Jesus was by receiving God fully through our sacred meditation expanded consciousness. May thy love shine forever on the sanctuary of our devotion. And may we be able to awaken thy love in all hearts. Om. Peace. Amen. And a joyous, expansive Christmas to you all.